addressing the call on uh, the issue of direct duty yep. uh, and had, I think, last made the point that if um, the correct response to such horseplay cases is to include that within the risk assessment, it was a ready answer that had eluded what so many other lawyers have had to decide these cases or been involved in them before now. Um, I'm going to invite the court to um, this view that the criticisms that are made of the lack of a specific risk assessment owe much, too much, to hindsight. And that the learned trial judge was right to view the matter uh, as he did from Tarmac's perspective, given that it would have been otherwise the alleged duty holder responsible for this enlarged duty to carry out a specific risk assessment associated with risk assessment. Um, and I say that because it's a marker of his careful judgment that he was at pains to set out at paragraph 74 of that judgment. The court finds it in the core bundle at 1, 2, 3. Um, a series of detailed findings in relation to this topic of tensions and frictions. Now it may be that um, I exceed the bounds of patience of the court in reading it out, but little a, the friction did not involve express or implied threats of violence, and Tarmac were not told that they did. I'm not satisfied that Mr. Chael or his brother Gavin asked to be taken off the site. In reporting tensions to Tarmac, no reference was made specifically to Mr. Heath. Judge at little d, I'm not satisfied that Mr. Heath was disciplined by Tarmac for threatening someone on site, or that he did threaten someone on site before the index incident. I accept that he was suspended for cheating his time records. Mr. Chell and Gavin perceived that tensions on the site had eased in the period just before the index incident. And a little left, Mr. Heath and Mr. Starr were not working in the workshop at the time of the incident it appears they made their way there in order to carry out a prank on Mr. Chell or possibly Mr. Chell or Gavin. <coughs> I've gone through those before, but there is the judge setting out painstakingly um, his views, which are of necessity relevant both to alleged direct duty and also vicarious liability on tensions and frictions. And then one can look at the matter from the claimant's perspective. And there, I cannot, uh, with respect to that learned judge, improve on the digest provided by Mr. Justice Martin Spencer uh, on the consequences of the findings of the trial judge. And what I have in mind is what one finds at paragraph 38 that first appeal judgment, which is page 76 in the core bundle. And if I can pick that up uh, some seven lines down from the start of the paragraph, Mr. Justice Spencer there says, furthermore, I take on board the point made by Mr. DeBerry arising from the evidence of Ms. King, that what she says would have happened can be translated into what should have happened in the absence of evidence that what she said would have happened did in fact happen. But the finding of the learned judge that the claimant did not in fact ask to be taken off site is an important one. It reveals that the true level of concern on the part of the claimant, and thus being imparted to Mr. Gain and through him to Tarmac, was significantly lower than that being portrayed retrospectively by the claimant at trial. And then I ask the court, 
as an appeal court to look at this from the point of view of the trial judge, uh, whose findings are, as it were, under attack. Um, and in doing so, uh, I draw attention to these features. First of all, uh, as part of the submissions that fell from Mr. de Berry at trial, he himself said the two witnesses who he, Leonard Jr., had proposed to call appear to have very little to do with this case because Fiona King was working on a different site for a different company, and then it goes on to deal with Mr. John Jones. And there uh, I've been reading from uh, the top of page 313 in the supplementary bundle where you see uh, the submissions of Mr. de Berry. And so far as Miss King is concerned... Sorry, can you just, just allow me one moment? Of course. Where on 313? Uh, that is five <coughs> lines from the top. Right, thanks. Yep. And then so far as um, Fiona King herself is concerned, two observations, I I if I may, leaving aside that she was to be viewed as a peripheral witness. The first is that her statement, uh, in the usual way, I hope I can infer this, was responding to the case as it was actually being alleged and put in the witness statement of the claimant. That is quite a different thing from what the judge in the end found. And therefore, um, it would be, with respect, wrong to extrapolate from that statement that um, she was in effect saying um, that an investigation would have been triggered. She was responding to the case as it had been put. But the other observation uh, is that, uh, and it's an interconnected one, we know what the judge actually found and what the court doesn't know, uh, and good reason I would respectfully submit, ought not to infer uh, anything adverse to the defendant, is what her response would have been if she'd been told simply, well, there is some friction, but it has eased. There has been an appropriate conversation between the supervisors. Additionally, I, I draw attention to the fact that, um, yes, there is reference to tension on one occasion, but uh, there was absolutely no evidence that that tension in any way had manifested itself by way of threats of violence or worse, threats of physical injury or worse, or indeed horseplay. Uh, the position, therefore, looking at it from the point of view of the trial judge is that in the light of the findings that he came to reach, all of which were reasoned, all of which were substantiated <coughs> by the evidence, uh, he was perfectly entitled to uh, express himself in the way that he did uh, about horseplay and risk assessment. Again, in fairness to the judge, the court ought to know that there was no reference to him about Schedule 1. Indeed, there was no reference about Schedule 1 to Mr. Justice Martin Spencer. First time it features that door having been all but closed is in the oral submissions of a learned friend. So there was reference to regulations three and four, but not to the supporting Correct. Schedule. 
So, <coughs> Alady, that's the, the response that I give so far as direct duty is concerned, and those are the submissions uh, in summary that I would address as relevant to the uh, two paragraphs within the statement of Fiona King. So, forgive me for putting it so simplistically, Mr. Lim, but is the essence of it on the facts as found by the judge that the findings are, if not unchallenged, they are wholly based on the evidence and are reasoned. And insofar as Ms. King's statement is concerned, it has to be viewed in the context of what was alleged at the time and isn't referable to the findings as they were made by the judge and therefore should be viewed in the light of those findings. Is yes. that fair? It, exactly so. Um, and, 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 and that's but an illustration of the wider truth about weight. Um, oh, yes, can you deal with weight? Well, simply that, um, uh, so far as Miss King is concerned, she, she was not called no. by either side. Her evidence is untested. Uh, and, and this court has, as it were, uh, well, indeed, Lord Justice Mayles has shut the door on, on adverse inferences. In other words, uh, why should one assume that even with the facts as they came to be found by the judge, um, there would have been um, particular steps taken, either by way of a particular risk assessment, though there had been no previous horse training, or some other steps. Um, and it, it, in that regard, it's right also that the court should know that um, for the first time in the appeal before Mr Justice Martin Spencer, it was suggested, well, one response might have been to tell the tarmac workforce that no, their jobs were not at risk because of the presence of the roll tech and tractors. But as Mr DeBerry fairly accepted before that judge, that isn't a point that had been made to the trial judge, again, viewing matters in fairness to him from his perspective. As I say, that, that's not particularly a submission that's advanced today, as the starting and end point, by and large, is or appears to be risk assessment. So that, that's a, a response which, if you will, and the court can deal with it at a number of levels, goes to whether, in fact, the scope and extent of the duty here extended as far as the appellant would have it, whether in fact the first fence was ever reached so that one could say that there was a breach of such a duty or indeed it might come in as part of the response on causation. In other words, what difference would it have made in the circumstances? So th th that in long and in short is the response given by the respondent on direct duty and you'll gather that in doing that I've sought to traverse also breach and causation. And unless I can assist further, what I propose to do is move on to vicarious liability. Just one point, if I may, Mr. Lim. Um, Mr. Huckle, I think, also um, quarrelled with the approach of the judge in relation to uh, uh, an erroneous focus on the threat of physical violence rather than looking for a reasonably foreseeable risk of injury. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I, I heard the submission, but in the end one is talking about a risk of injury. Was there posed a foreseeable risk of injury? And um, without making um, a, a, a lazy submission um, about um, men in a workplace largely populated with men, if there is going to be a risk of physical injury posed between fellow employees, it's likely to be a risk of physical injury, i.e. violence. So in the circumstances of this case, the one rather collapses into the other.
I, I think just on causation, I just draw to the court's attention, probably unnecessarily, what the judge had to say, um, and that is found at paragraph 71 of his judgment, four bundle 122, where he observed those acts, that is acts of horseplay, by their very nature are acts that the employee must know are outside behaviour that they should engage in at work. And that has a bearing on causation. I'll move then, if I may, to the, the third matter uh, foreshadowed as, as, as my bill of fare, which is on the vicarious liability. Um, and, and if only to make the point that um, the, the also run has, has nudged its way to the front in this um, race, which may not get to particular fences. Um, <coughs> paragraph four of Mr. DeBerry's skeleton argument for trial said to the judge, the main legal issue concerns the scope of vicarious liability. Um, now, can I deal with it firstly by just identifying um, the legal test or tests which the learned trial judge purported to apply? Because it's my simple submission that His Honour Judge Rawlings demonstrably understood that uh, determining whether to impose vicarious liability required him to apply a two-limb test. And that two-limb test is found at paragraphs 44 and 45 of Lister, Appeal Bundle 7, page 220. I don't invite your attention to it, but presume to summarise it. The first limb, whether the relationship between the defendant and the primary wrongdoer was so close that it was capable of giving rise to vicarious liability. And then the second limb, whether the connection between that relationship and the primary wrongdoing was close enough to impose liability on the defendant. And so far as the first limb is concerned, that was, of course, straightforward. Given that Mr. Heath was an employee of Tarmac, he was in a close relationship with it, duly found, paragraph 52A of the judgment for bundle 117. The real dispute centred on the close connection test under the second limb. And again, as the judge correctly identified, that required a two-stage analysis, considering first the field of activities entrusted to Mr. Heath by Tarmac, and secondly, whether there was a sufficient connection between that field of activities and the position in which Mr. Heath was employed, and Mr. Heath's act of striking the two targets with a hammer close to Mr. Chell's ear to hold that Tarmac should be liable having regard to the principles of social justice. And my ladies, my lord, there I have been reading from paragraph 52C of the judgment for bundle 118. As the learned trial judge again correctly understood in applying the second limb it was right on the authorities to call to his mind the five factors derived from Mrs. Justice McLachlan's judgment, as she then was, in uh, Baisley and Curry. Uh, and that was approved by Lord Justice Longmore, as we've seen in Graham and Commercial Bodies. And the judge expressly does that and tells us that he's doing that at paragraph 50. 2D for bundle 118 and is at pains um, to set those out. And I've just rehearsed all of that because my simple submission is that there is no basis for a challenge that is on a judge Rawlings did not state the correct legal tests. He clearly did. And, and his exposition of the relevant principles was exemplary, fully and correct, correctly reflecting the authoritative statements from the recent leading cases. Uh, I'm not sure even now whether the appellant challenges 
whether the judge applied the right legal tests, but those are the right legal tests, and he did have them in mind. I think what's said against you is not that he didn't apply the right legal test, but that in applying the legal test, his evaluative judgment was wrong. Let me then grapple with that. Let's look first at the field of activities, as the field of activities that Mr. Heath was entrusted to do by Tarmac. And here are the key findings. First, the conduct that he actually indulged in forms no part of his work, was unconnected to any work-related instruction, and in no way advanced Tarmac's purposes. Sorry, I was slow in starting to write there. The conduct is unrelated. No, it's my fault. The conduct is unrelated. So the conduct formed no part of his work, was unconnected to any work-related instruction, and in no way advanced Tarmac's purposes. And that is rooted in the judge's findings at 59B, C, and E, all of which are found in Core Bundle 119. Secondly, the judge found that whilst the hammer was work equipment, the pellet targets were brought on site from outside. And that's at Para 13B of the judgment, Core Bundle 110. And the third key finding, so far as field of activities is concerned, is that Mr. Heath had no supervisory role relating to the claimant's work. And I just tag, or I'll come on to it, that that's obviously also relevant to the fourth and fifth Baisley factors, to use that shorthand. And one finds those findings at Paragraph 14, Core Bundle 110, and Paragraph 59D, Core Bundle 119, within the judgment. And they amply justified what the learned judge found. And here I'm reading from 59F, Core Bundle 119, that Mr. Heath's work merely provided an opportunity to carry out the prank that he played, rather than the prank in any sense being in the field of activities that Tarmac had assigned to Mr. Heath. So that was the analysis and the reasoning, so far as field of activities is concerned. I'll move now to looking at it in terms of friction and confrontation. And that goes, again to tag it, to the third of the Baisley factors. And what the judge identified as useful to determination was a spectrum of friction and confrontation, as he put it. And that phrase is found at 63, subparagraph C, Core Bundle 120. And at one end of the spectrum, tensions so serious as to suggest the possibility of physical violence, or at least physical confrontation, Core Bundle 120, 63C, that would indicate a sufficiently close connection, but tensions making the workplace uncomfortable, but falling short of being threatened, were insufficient. And that's from the same subparagraph. Now given the judge's findings made about the claimant's evidence, rejecting many aspects of his account, this claim fell wrongly, squarely at the wrong end of the spectrum for the claimant. And my simple submission is that that spectrum of friction and confrontation is a perfectly sensible, common sense, helpful tool which led the judge to a reasonable conclusion that there was insufficient friction for vicarious liability. Now the third aspect of the judge's reasoning, field of activities has been looked at, friction, confrontation has been looked at, the third aspect is that Mr. Heath did not intend to cause injury to the claimant. His finding was that this was a joke gone wrong. 
And that finding was actually based on the words used by the claimant himself. Joke gone wrong, the court will find in the supplementary bundle at page 277, to the middle of the page. And in cross-examination, as the judge noted, that's paragraph 17 of his judgment, Mr. Shell accepted that Mr. Heath's actions were likely to be a joke which went wrong. And the relevance of that finding is that it points away from a workplace where tensions were high to the point uh, that one man was intent on injuring another, or that that was foreseeable, which in turn chimed with the finding, not challenged, that there were no threats of violence. Now, although the important judgment uh, with respect to the first appeal judge is the trial judge's judgment, I I'm going to deal um, briefly, if I may, with Mr. Justice Marston Spencer's reasoning on vicarious liability. And the justification for doing so is that the trial judgment predated Morrison. Um, but that had been handed down by the time of the first appeal. And the first thing to note is that the Supreme Court in Morrison adopted the same two-stage analysis of the close connection test under the second limb. And that was rightly noted by um, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer at paragraph 36, four bundle 75. And secondly, as the judge uh, noted, and as Mr. De Berry rightly conceded, if anything matters were made more difficult for the claimant's case um, by Morrison, because in that authority, Lord Reed made clear that the temporal connection is less significant in itself, with more weight to be attached to the capacity and purported basis on which the perpetrator acts. And, and ladies, my lord, that is picking up on what was said by Lord Reed um, in Authorities Bundle, tab 11, page 317 in the Authorities Bundle, at paragraph 31b. In other words, the temporal connection is less significant in itself, with more weight to be attached to the capacity and purported basis on which the perpetrator acts. And then, so far as the first appeal judge's reasoning is concerned, uh, his view and his reasonable view is that the claimant's rain, remaining arguments on precarious liability were either factual issues adequately considered and rejected by uh, his honour judge rulings, or were matters wholly incidental to the act in question, such as the hammer itself being a work um, and one therefore reaches the conclusion, at least I do in my submissions, in terms of the evaluative judgment, to pick up on that uh, precise phrase, uh, derived from the authorities, that what the judge undertook uh, was in fact a fact-sensitive, evaluative judgment, uh, just as required in resolving such cases. And that was rightly underscored by Mr Justice Martin Spencer in dismissing the appeal. And one sees, if you like, a summary of that um, distillation of, of, of where it ended up so far as Judge Rawling is concerned, Paragraph 63E of his judgment, for bundle 120. Tension, however, which consisted only of verbal confrontation, not suggesting the risk of violence which made Mr. Shaw feel uncomfortable, where the wrongful act consisted of a joke not intended to cause physical injury, but which resulted in physical injury because of the recklessness of the wrongdoer, does not in my judgment, form a sufficiently close connection between the risk posed by the tensions on site and the wrongful act 
such as to make it right to hold tarmac liable under the principles of social justice. So delivering precisely the evaluative judgment looked for. Now, in deference to Lord Justice Males, who recognised in giving permission on vicarious liability as the primary ground, and in, I hope, seeking to assist the court, I will ad address, just for completeness, certain submissions on the two tests that have emerged. Um, that is, focusing on the field of activities test, I've already gone to the judge's reasoning about that, where we say we win, but if there's a broader test, the enterprise risk test, again, we say tails the talent loses. So in the field of activities test, what is happening is there is a focus on the employee's express functions, duties and responsibilities. They are taken as the most concrete, useful reference point. And in the field of violence and horseplay, uh, Lord Justice Longmore in Graham did identify a category of case involving findings of vicarious liability where the use of reasonable force or the existence of friction is inherent in the nature of the employment. <coughs> and very obvious examples of that would be for example, a, a, a bouncer in a Nike. But that is not this case. What, <coughs> what, does, um, what does Lord Justice Longmore mean when I'm looking at paragraph 16 of, of Graham? Yes. Where he refers to the, um, <coughs> the, the cases of friction, where friction's inherent in the job. You're a bouncer, so you beat people up. Um, uh, and that's part of your job. Well, it's not, but you understand what I mean. Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> but then he goes on to say, <clears throat> at the end of paragraph 16, similarly, there are cases of what one might call normal friction in the workplace, which gets out of hand, as opposed to uncalled for antagon antagonism, which, while occurring in the workplace, originates outside it. Um, <clears throat> Is that meant to be a reference to the what's being said here, that for whatever reason there were tensions in the workplace um, <coughs> which potentially could have led somebody to behave in a particular way? Well, I, 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 I took it from how um, the Lord Justice then goes on because he then discusses the case of Weddell and Warbank, and I'll come on to those, that he was having in mind those cases. In other words, Mr. Weddell worked in a care home, not one, of course, where the potential threat of um, physical violence would ever feature, and Mr. Warbank worked on a building site. But they are interesting factual examples of cases where it has spilled over. In the Weddell case, vicarious liability was not found. In the Warbank case, it was. And without for a moment ducking the question, my lord, when I come to those cases, uh -huh. I, I'll, I'll illustrate from their facts the, the differences and the dividing line and why Mr. Chell's case places him on the Weddell side of the line rather than the Warbank side of the line, if I can <coughs> like that. Right, sorry, I should have let you take your own course. No, no, um, not at all, my lord. In, what, what, what I'm saying, though, is that if you take as, as one guide the field of activities test, and, and in particular focus on the employee's functions, duties, and responsibilities, then you can see why in Graham um, vicarious liability was not found as an example. Um, but equally well, and concerned to get this across to the court, one can understand why in the Muhammad case, vicarious liability was established. And the reason I say that is because in ordering the claimant to leave the petrol station kiosk, 
um, Mr. The, the, what was happening fell within the employee's field of activities and he was purporting to act on his employer's behalf in reinforcing that order with violence. Uh, and that's the finding that was very specifically reached. If I can invite the court's attention to um, that authority, it's found behind tab 10 in the authorities binding. And in particular, if one goes, please, to page 285, bundle pagination, you will find within the uh, speech of Lord Toulson um, what he says at paragraph 47, just above letter B. Uh, so I, I'll read that if I may. When Mr. Khan followed the claimant back to his car and opened the front passenger door, he again told the claimant in threatening words that he was never to come back to the petrol station. This was not something personal between them. It was an order to keep away from the employer's premises, which he reinforced by violence. In giving such an order, he was purporting to act about his employer's business. It was a gross abuse of his position, but it was in connection with the business in which he was employed. And that, if you like, is the, the, the ratio or the, the core point about Mohammed. And it was on that basis that Lord Reed, um, identifying those very passages, explained Mohammed in Morrison, insofar as it needed or called for any explanation anyway. A another example of this um, focus, if you will, on the employee's express functions, duties and responsibilities is provided by the Bellman case. And that is found behind tab 2 in the authority fund. And I once more ask the court to turn that up. And in particular go to pages 47 and 48 of the authority. And what was said by Lady Justice Asplin at paragraphs 26 and 27. I'm not going to read it out uh, extensive, extensively, as it were, but um, what one sees is that the determinative factor, so far as the Court of Appeal was concerned, and this emerges particularly at paragraph 27, is that this. Um, late hours, out of work hours, Christmas do, which then went on for drinks, all went wrong because of a, 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 an argument between the MD and Mr. Bellman, leading to an assault. And Lady Justice Asplin emphasised that uh, it was properly to be analysed in terms of the MD exercising his managerial function. In other words, a resolute focus once more on the functions, duties and responsibilities of the attacker. And just, it, 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 it perhaps hardly needs making good, but again, um, that is exactly what um, Lord Reed derived from the Bellman Authority. So if you would go now forwards to tab 11 and page 321 in our authorities bundle. Uh, you will find there, I hope, paragraph and it's particularly the passage of letter B. So, notwithstanding.
understanding that the assault occurred outside work hours and away from the workplace, there was clearly a very close connection between the managing director's authorised activities as an employee and his commission of the assault. It was committed while he was reporting to act in the course of his employment as the managing director by asserting his authority over his subordinates in relation to a management decision which he had taken. So one can see through those authorities, if you like, a, a definite strand or a refrain that is focusing on um, functions, duties and responsibilities. Now, having rehearsed all of that, by contrast, this manifestly is not such a case because Mr Heath had no function, uh, duty or responsibility uh, directly or even indirectly related to his wrongdoing. Uh, the learned judge found, as he was entitled to do, that Mr Heath had no supervisory managerial role over the claimant, he was not working with the claimant, and he was meant to be in a different area to the claimant at the material time. So one could not in any sense characterise Mr Heath's role as one of having but misusing some institutional authority with managerial status or some plenary powers, duties and responsibilities. <coughs> so following that a way of looking at it, in other words this emphasis on the field of activities, which obviously has as its close cousin, was the um, third party on a frolic of his own, the employee on a frolic of his own, um, one can see how they all point away from the finding of vicarious liability here. Heads, the respondent wins. As to the enterprise risk test, um, let's look at that briefly. Um, and that involves a reversion to Bayesley. And can I begin with just one passage um, within the judgment of Mrs. Justice McLachlan, as she then was. It's found at page 27 in our authority bundle. Um, and if you like, this is the learned justice's distillation of um, where the five factors need to lead to for a finding of vicarious liability. Um, picking it up at 42 second line, there must be a strong connection between what the employer was asking the employee to do, the risk created by the employer's enterprise, and the wrongful act. It must be possible to say that the employer significantly, and that word is underlined in the judgment, significantly increase the risk of the harm by putting the employee in his or her position and requiring him to perform the assigned tasks. So those set pretty high bars, a strong connection and a significant increase in risk. That very passage was picked out by Lord Carraway in Vicuvium, and you'll find it at paragraph 22 in that judgment, um, page 426, tab 15 in the authority bond. And as we know, the Bayesley factors were expressly approved uh, in cases of intentional, non-sexual wrongdoing in the Graham case. And um, His Honour Judge Rawlings correctly recognised that what Lord Justice Longmore in Graham was saying was that in considering whether there was a sufficient connection between the wrong complained of and the employer's creation of the risk which created that connection, there were those five factors, amongst others, that could be considered, could be considered in deciding whether that creation or enhancement of risk created a sufficiently close relationship between the action and the relationship with the defendant and the wrongdoer. There I was reading from paragraph 49 of the judgment bundle 117. And what the judge did, in fairness to him, is to consider those factors to the extent that they apply on the facts as he found them to be in Mr. Chell's case, and he carried out 
a nuanced evaluation of the different contextual factors um, uh, and did what he's enjoined to do by the authority. Now what the authorities also enjoin us to do, Baisley does, so also um, the point is made by Lord Reed in the Morrison case, is to look at comparators. Um, so it's not just a case of hoping to co-opt the facts, as it were, from one case into this one. It's a necessary part of the evaluative judgment. Um, and in particular Lord Reed um, in terms of high authority most recently says this in Morrison at paragraph 22 letter C which is at page 314 in the authorities bundle um, behind tab 11 essentially the court makes an evaluative judgment in each case having regard to all the circumstances and importantly having regard also to the assistance provided by previous court decisions. In this field, the latter form of assistance is particularly valuable. And so that's why, within our skeleton argument, we did draw attention to a number of decisions. Um, I have already um, addressed you on uh, Bellman. I don't propose to say a deal more about the Graham case, uh, save to note, and this goes to uh, the question of equipment being brought on site, that the, 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 the Graham case involved bringing a lighter into contact with thinners. The lighter had come off site, the thinners were on site, and it's very easy to equiparate that with situation here, the target pellets off site, the hammer on site. And there was no evidence given at the trial that the thinners themselves posed any risk of injury to an employee. The risk of injury arose solely from Mr. Wilkinson's independent introduction and application of the cigarette lighter to the appellant. And in the same way here, um, very obviously the comparison is bringing the target pellets on and um, striking the hammer against them. So it's about the lighter, it's about the pellet target, it's not about the thinners and the hammer. We also draw attention to the Vicuvian case court will find Lord Carraway's reasoning um, at paragraph 22 and 37 in particular, 426 and 427 in the authorities bundle and the same judge, not then I think the Lord Justice Clark in Wilson and Excel um, is dealing with a case involving the pulling of a ponytail whilst making a, a ribald remark Again, vicarious liability not found, and the judge's reasoning set out at paragraphs 30 and 33 to 34, which the court will find, <coughs> should it need to turn it up, pages 354 and 355 in the authorities' bond. That then leaves, by way of comparators that are drawn to this court's attention, uh, the cases of Levitt, Weddell, and Warbank. Um, let me deal with Weddell and Wallbank in the first instance. They are found behind tab 12, and as my friend Mr. Huttle explained, this was the subject of a conjoined appeal. And in the Weddell case, vicarious liability not found. In the Wallbank case, uh, it was on appeal established. And so far as the Weddell case is concerned, the facts are set out at 329. And then so far as the Wallbank case is concerned, the facts are digested, paragraphs 8 to 11 on page 330. Um, in the way of 
um, the conclusions reached, it's clear that the Court of Appeal found it reasonably straightforward to uphold the view that there was no vicarious liability as had been reached at trial. Um, and um, that although both cases involved, if you like, um, violence, um, the Weddell case was clearly the wrong side of the line um, because there wasn't, as it were, any response to uh, uh, an instruction or the like. By contrast, the Wallbank case. Can I just pick out these features? If you go, please, to paragraph 47. Blank page. I'm so sorry, sorry. lady. 341 in the authorities bundle. Sorry? 341. Three. So th I, I ought to have set the scene a little better. It's, it's about feeding materials into an oven. And it was felt that um, um, more could have been done and that heat was being lost unprofitably because not <coughs> enough was being placed into the oven. And the person who came to be insult uh, assaulted, who was in a managerial position, as it happens, had come round to the other end of the oven and said to Mr. Brown, his assailant, come on indicating that it was his intention to assist with the loading in. And the court finds that at paragraph 11. Um, and it's at that point that the altercation took place, and it was a violent one. But the um, actual conclusions reached by Lord Justice Hill, who gave the main judgment, but there are judgments in addition um, from uh, Lord Justice Morbid and Lord Justice Aiken, uh, but at paragraph 47, Lord Justice Pill says, in Wallbank, the conduct of the tortfeasor cannot be described as a prank or as horseplay, one distinguishing feature, unlike Wilson, and does not readily come within the traditional epithet of being uh, on a frolic of his own or an unrelated and independent venture of his own. Moderate force was used in a spontaneous but deliberate reaction to a lawful instruction. And then going to the bottom of that page, paragraph 52, um, this essential conclusion reached on the appeal, picking it up at the second sentence, not only was the violence closely related to the employment in both time and space, it was a spontaneous and almost instantaneous, if irrational, response to an instruction. Undoubtedly, reaction to instructions, normally by way of carrying them out, is a part of employment, whether as a powder coat or in any other um, capacity. So also, if you like, a bad reaction to an instruction. And, um, that point, as it were, landed with Lord Justice Morbick. One sees that in the very last sentence of his judgment, paragraph 61, page 343. I also agree that wrongful acts committed by one employee against another while at work can give rise to more difficult questions, but in the present case, the circumstances in which Mr. Brown assaulted Mr. Walbank in particular the fact that he had acted in immediate response to instructions given to him are sufficient to satisfy me that he was acting in the course of his employment. And the like point is made by Lord Justice Aikens, paragraph 67, 344, um, where you, one sees, amongst other things, it is clear on the facts that Mr. Brown attacked Mr. Wallbank as a result of the instructions given by Mr. Wallbank to Mr. Brown. So, going back to my Lord, Lord Justice Davies, I, I hope having seen those cases, one can see um, what second category, out with directly functions or responsibilities, Lord Justice Longmore was calling to mind. 
Um, the only other comparator that is identified and it, it is fresh to this case, that is, it wasn't uh, found and cited to the learned trial judge or to uh, Mr. Justice Martin Spencer, is the case of Levitt. Um, and that is found at tab 6. And I do invite the court's attention to that in the time that is available to me. Um, because um, the irony is that though its, it's uh, introduction was, was um, sought, it doesn't feature in the skeleton argument, um, it actually very precisely illustrates the sort of facts that place um, this case uh, in a different category from the Levitt case. Um, Paragraph 1 tells us that sadly the claimant sustained head injuries as a result of work colleague Kieran Fowler striking him on the head with a scaffolding pole. There was also an assault with a brick as it happens and there was a significant uh, imprisonment of Mr Fowler. Um, now, if one goes through the findings that were made by his honour judge Jeremy Friedman, sitting as a High Court judge. At paragraph 14, um, there is recorded he, that is the claimant, worked with, amongst others, Neil Dolan. The gang's labourer was Kieran Fowler. So they worked together. That's the first point. Paragraph 15, it's clear that this argument was actually all about work. Um, the claimant having arrived on the site shortly before 8am was in search of bricks and muck to enable him to start the day's work. To that end he sought out Kieran Fowler. And then you see recorded the facts at little one, little two, little three. I, I don't trouble to read them out but move now to paragraph 17. Um, we're with an important finding uh, on the totality of the evidence I am satisfied that there was an argument on the scaffolding involving the Fowlers and the claimant and that the subject matter was the lack of materials work available to the claimant in other words it's very directly related to them working together as a team at paragraph 26 we know that the um, weapon that was used was in fact the work equipment, in other words the scaffolding pole. And then the um, he was also hit, I said, with a brick and the court will find that at 31 little 3, so another piece of work equipment obviously on a building site. And then the key findings are set out at um, page 195, um, <coughs> paragraph 80. And it's specifically those findings 80 little 3 to 80 little 5. Now again, standing back, and using the comparator approach as part of the evaluation, one can immediately see um, that none of those findings <coughs> find a comparison in the findings of fact made in, in the instant case. And in no way did Mr. Levitt's case involve horseplay or acting on a frolic of his own. Um, this was all about the work that together they were doing using work equipment. So it is unsurprising that the Court of Appeal did not grant permission to appeal from this judgment. That's all I have to say in terms of the field of activities test, the enterprise risk test, and then looking at the comparators. And frankly, my ladies, my lord, I, I probably
probably reached the point where I don't have any further submissions to advance and therefore should try and resist the temptation in doing so. Can I assist? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <coughs> Lily, I won't repeat the submissions I made to you this morning, but there are a few points I'd like specifically to respond to. Um, firstly, um, Lynn Fred made up observations about time I spent on a certain aspect in the beginning of my submissions, and I retort, if I may, by just saying that there was a lot of focus in Melinda Friend's submissions about the rejection of the appellant's account by the judge. Um, I, I hope it's not rude to say, so what? We're dealing with the facts as found by the judge, and whether the, whether the judge then applied the law correctly to them. This is not some kind of hesitate to use the word game, but um, forensic uh, debate where you know, the question for this court is whether the claimant deserves in some general sense to be um, to recover. I don't think that's what uh, Mr. Lim was saying at all. What he was doing was responding to your submission that the judge's findings of fact are not supported by any evidence. Well, and certainly I accept that in some cases that's right. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, if I may, but I'll, I'll move on, my lady. Um, as far as the um, first liability aspects are concerned, one of the points Minerva makes is that the judge rejected uh, the idea that the claimant was in fear for his personal safety, and that is certainly true. Uh, but frankly, the claimant needed to be in fear for his personal safety, as events turned out. Um, what Mr. Heath did was dangerous. Uh, again, that goes to the question of how one looks at something called practical joke or um, horseplay. Uh, we can get that very clearly from the investigative report of Mr. Wilson at Supplemental Bundle 215. And I observe that the judge... I don't think he specifically dealt with Mr. Wilson's report, but certainly, for example, in paragraph 16 of the judgment at Core 111, uh, you will find a reference. Um, it's on the point about lightening the mood, the rejection of the idea that Mr. Heath was trying to lighten the mood. And you'll see at paragraph 16 uh, that um, uh, the judge rejected that idea. He's, he's reporting there what Mr. DeBerry's submission about it was. Um, and then in the next paragraph, he um, does indeed reject that idea. Um, and as, uh, um, as the judge says, consistent, as it were, with the report of Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson's report at 215, I, I, I submit, is an important uh, part of the case in relation to the, I, the idea of, of, the, uh, of what Mr. Heath doing, being dangerous. So when one talks about practical joke, um, it was the clear view of the investigator that to startle someone who was operating a bandsaw was in itself a dangerous thing to do. And then can I just mention uh, about the, what the nature of the tension was? M may I ask you, because it's true, the judge did not accept all of the claimants, or his brothers for that matter, evidence on this point, and preferred, if you remember, where there was a, a dispute, as it were, the oral evidence of Mr. Gain. And I, I don't seem to go behind that, but uh, perhaps I could just ask you to analyze it a little bit. If you look at Supplemental Bundle, page 109. <laughs> begins on page 108, but where this is the statement of Mr. Shell, the claimant, the on 109, I'm terribly sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you, but not at all. You, you keep referring us to Mr. Wilson. Who or what is Mr. Wilson? 
Oh, I'm so sorry. Mr. Mr. Wilson is the gentleman who carried out, I think, a form of independent investigation into the incident. So if you look at... Uh, well, I mean, I've got... It says IAW Investigations Limited. Yeah. So I, what is he, an ex-policeman? Lord, you have as much information about that as I do, I'm right. afraid. It's just a report which um, was part of the investigation materials, and he reached certain conclusions, which, as I've already said, didn't in, many way bind, in any way bind the judge. No, of course they didn't. But no. they were part of the evidential picture. That's all I'm, uh, all I'm saying well, about it. You say they were part of the evidential picture. How much weight can be given to a report that, um, of which the court really has no first-hand knowledge at all? It's a document. Um, that is true, milady. But on the other hand, the same can be said about the, the finding of, by the judge to reject, if you like, um, the lightning of the mood um, uh, suggestion, because that was only made in those materials and rejected by Mr. Wilson, and that rejection appears to have been accepted by the judge. So uh, it doesn't go very far, but milady, it seems from that that the judge was paying some regard to what Mr. Wilson. I'd say, but I accept the point that your leadership makes to you, of course. My, my, my only concern, I, I, I had mistakenly thought Mr. Wilson was <coughs> a, a consulting engineer of some sort, of the kind no, not in a my day you used to see a lot of yeah. in these cases, perhaps yeah. you don't anymore. But in fact, his view that something was highly dangerous, uh, was dangerous and highly likely to cause a serious injury, frankly has about as much weight as the usher saying. I mean, it's just a, a comment. I, I take my Lord's point. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say, in response, it's a matter of common sense in the nature well, of the work. It may well be, but... But you're, you're quite right. Um, but it, all I was seeking to point out was it appears that the judge was in some way influenced by that, at least that comment. Um, but I can't take it any, any further than that, of course. I was then on to um, what, Mr. what the, the appellant said. Um, about the background circumstances, which is, as I say, on page 109. Now, I want to be careful about this because, of course, if one looks uh, on um, to page 110, if, if, if you will, from paragraph 14 on, um, the judge did not accept the account of the claimant about these matters. Well, he didn't accept other parts of it which precede no, I, I, I agree, lady. I was going to try to, um, to, to well, invite the court to, to, to look at it. Um, I think there are specific matters which the judge did not accept uh, within the preceding paragraphs. Uh, but, but there is no indication that I have found in the judgment that he j rejected the generality of it. So um, the flavour of what the tensions were like and what they, you know, how they manifested um, is, in my respectful submission, still there in the evidence of the claimant and his brother. It's not as if the judge said, I reject entirely their account of the matter, but he certainly rejected certain aspects of it. So that's, that is my only point, that it's not, as it were, to be ignored what the claimant and his brother said about the background. And then, Mr. Huckle, speaking entirely for myself, I think your difficulty is quite how detailed those findings of fact were by the judge. I mean, they were yeah. detailed. Um, and uh, he was clearly impressed by Mr. Gay. He and was. accepted his evidence um, when it conflicted with that of the claimant and or his brother. Uh, absolutely did. He absolutely did, my lady. And perhaps I can move straight on then to Mr. Gain. Because the statement from Mr. Gain at um, Supplemental Bundle 120 um, is, uh, frankly, on for these purposes, rather light. Um, but he was, he was cross examined. examined. Yes, yes. He was cross examined, and there is his oral evidence, and that's the next, next bit. But obviously, it would not be right that's just. That's difficulty, really, for you, isn't it? Well, because on the, just on that statement alone, there yeah. wasn't a lot in it. No. The, Difficulty for you is what came out in cross examination. Well, I, I understand the point you make to me, Milady, but it, but I don't really see it as a difficulty because I'm trying or have been accepting the fact findings by and large, the findings of fact that the judge made them. But what I'm, I'm the trying to. The point I was making, Mr. Huckle, is we can all remember our times as advocates. <laughs> and when you see a short statement, you have got to make the decision do I keep it short and tight or do I open it up at my peril? Of I'm course. not going to make any more comments on that. <laughs> no, 
Milady, no, but I do want to, if I may, just take you to Supplemental Bundle 295, which is how Mr. Gain ended his evidence on this point. And when you say this point, you mean the tensions? The tensions yeah. and, and their implications. Just tell me, what, tell us what you're looking for, Mr. Hutcombe, Mr. Cooper, before you go. Yeah. <coughs> it's what you referred to as, as to before, Mr. Gaines' final answer, or the penultimate answer in uh, re-examination. When he yes. said what he expected Tarmac to do. Yes, my lord, exactly. And yes. then my point about it is that Mr. Gain clearly didn't, was not looking at this as a matter which did not require further action. That's my point. So that in terms of if you like the severity or, or gravity of the tensions, Mr. Gain said that as far as he was concerned, it was for uh, Tarmac, who were responsible for the health and safety of um, the Chells, because it was both of them, of course, making the, making the reference and making the, raising the concern. It was for them to act, and that's what he expected to happen. So I'm just trying to set in context, really, what the overall evidential picture about that was. And then can I just, as far as the evidence of Ms. King, I mean, I've dealt with that in some detail, obviously, but just to reiterate, her, her statement was one of the two late statements. So it's true to say that she had seen the accounts, was responding in part to the accounts that had been served on behalf of the claimant, that is, those three statements. Um, but again, I just reiterate, her evidence is what it is that however vague is the expression she uses about the concerns being raised, they would not let it escalate. Again, all of this goes to the idea that it is the gravity of the risk to be apprehended which directly informs the consideration of what is a close connection. And, and I've already said, and I repeat it, I reject that assertion. I'm not saying it's not one of the overall circumstances, but it is by no means determinative. as a matter of law. I will, uh, the Schedule 1 point, very briefly, I, I think I accepted when raising it before the, your, the court this morning, it was not something which dealt with in detail. It, it's actually, lady, um, Schedule 1 is specifically referred by Regulation 4, but that's, that's all Regulation 4 does, actually, is refer, um, for the purposes of say, Regulation 3, refer the principles in Schedule 1. Um, as I think I, I said, it, it's possible to criticise everyone in the case um, about that, that the judge wasn't asked specifically to consider Schedule 1. Um, he didn't ask to consider it. It does not appear that he considered the terms of the regulations themselves. Neither advocate, I'm sure they'll take it on the chin, neither advocate asked him specifically to do that. But as I said earlier, we're in the Court of Appeal now. And it's about what the correct law is to consider in relation to facts as found. Vicarious liability. Uh, Can I just get this clear as you moved on to vicarious liability? Are you accepting? I, I know the judge, uh, when he did it, to use your phraseology, didn't have Morrison too. But yep. are you accepting that his statement of the law was correct? just don't accept the way in which he applied it. I, I, I think that's right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say there's nothing about the way the judge stated the law that I wouldn't take issue with. But overall, that's certainly right. And I don't demur from the idea that the judge made a real effort to consider the, the cases and to set out the law as he understood it. And I, you know, as you will know from the way I put my submissions, I've not gone to those um, points in detail and said he got that completely wrong or this completely wrong. Um, it is about the application of the, the correct application of the law. So firstly, I do not accept that the question of vicarious liability has ever been relegated to anything. It's a matter of, as I, I hope I made clear in, in opening and dealing with the EL aspects in detail, it's a matter of context. We say this case succeeds, should succeed on both EL and VL basis. 
Um, secondly, Leonard Friend, I of course gave you the citations from the Basley judgment of uh, Justice McLaughlin and the whole seven court, seven uh, judge court. Um, Leonard Friend has taken you to some. All I can do is invite you to read all of them because I say that that's the proper context for the discussion. My next note was to confirm exactly what you just asked me to confirm, the lady, um, in response to, I think, um, Lady Justice Simler's point to Leonard Friend, that uh, that's the way we go. Um, and I say that, you know, this idea that the court should be reticent about intervening, um, it should not be reticent about intervening if it concludes that the judge applied the law in, a, in the wrong way. It's, it's not a factual argument, pr primarily. Um, and just as in Warbank, that's, um, we see it, don't we, in, um, in the Supreme Court cases themselves. The court should intervene if it considers it's the right to do so. Um, and, and, and let's be clear, I've said it more than once, this case is not about vicarious liability on the basis of furtherance of the employer's business or assertion uh, of authority. It is a friction case. It is the friction which can, and in our case, our submission does, provide the close connection, very close connection, with the work. And my own friend said that the Graham case uh, used the word equiparate, that um, um, you know, we can equiparate the circumstances there with this. Well, we can't. In the Graham case, it was nothing to do with the work on the findings of the court. Um, the other cases, as, uh, as I tried to deal with them earlier briefly, they are reviewed by Lord Justice Longmore, and the facts of them are identified, and the reasons why the cases failed where they did fail are explained. But in very brief summary, Wilson and Excel, the ponytail prank case, nothing to do with the work. Vaikuveni, um, the attack on grounds of um, racism, nothing to do with the work. Weddell, um, in that case, on, on, one, on the face of it, a linkage with the work, but the finding was that the work was simply a pretext for the violence that was um, issued, not about the work. Uh, Wallbank, which is a different situation altogether, but it was a, that was a, um, an exercise of authority case, an assertion of authority by the employee for whose action the employer was felt to be liable. Um, no, sorry, I've got that wrong. Uh, Wallbank is the response to the instruction case. Well, uh, clearly, a direct response of an employee to the exercise of a senior uh, colleague's authority uh, but it isn't difficult to see how that's about the work. And so I reiterate, close connection is not about the gravity of the threat. It's about whether what happened was about the work. And that's the explanation for the distinction which um, uh, my Lord William Davis, uh, LJ, um, put to my own friend, and I put it to the court. Uh, likewise, or similarly, cases of I won't take you back to that citation, but it's paragraph 16, I think, of the, of the Graham judgment. And then, I think, uh, finally, uh, oh, I should mention, again, I suppose, Levitt. I, I hadn't taken you to Levitt, and I'll, I'll leave you to enjoy, enjoy that. But um, the way I would put that is that it was, an, it was clearly an argument all about the work. Um, the time scales, of course, are different. And the nature of the argument is different. But in, in many ways, it's not very different from this. Um, th this was an incident. There wasn't an argument as such. But um, this is a, a general background argument about the work. And then I think finally, brief mention of the Bellman case, my friend, I think, relied upon. Um, I've got a note to take you to um, Authorities Bundle 48, paragraph 27, uh, the end of it. Let me just um, find that.
Yes, yeah, so you see, uh, just, to, just to remind, the highlighted sections are par paragraph 26. This is the respondent's highlight. Uh, paragraph 26 through to the end of paragraph 27. And I wanted to reiterate the final remark in paragraph 27. There is no suggestion in the judgment, nor were any submissions made to us, to the effect that Mr. Major's behaviour arose as a result of something personal. He delivered about a lecture about his managerial authority in relation to uh, NR as a whole as a result of the challenge to that authority. That's a million miles away from this oh, case. A million miles, but again, the, the distinction being drawn is, was this about the work or was this personal? Well, there's also the finding, just above D, that he purported to exercise control over the staff by summoning them Absolutely. And then expounding the extent and scope of his authority. Uh, absolutely. And Milady, I accept, of course, and would say it's a different case. I'm not relying upon it as a comparator for our purposes directly. Um, but it's easy to draw comparisons and distinctions uh, between the cases. And there are plenty of both in, in, in relation to the Bellman um, case. Um, And I think my point really is, as we can see from paragraph 29, which we have highlighted, the court took the view that this was a, a Mohammed type of case. That if you like, the relevant employee was clothed with the authority uh, of the employer. And that's what made it, gave it a close connection. I fear I could get bogged down in that, so I want to close, if I may, by um, uh, just well. I don't think there is any really, any, really any other matter that I wish wish to respond to. But, uh, I'm in your hands. I hope that's checking the junior again. No, thank you very much. I suppose it's too far to reach to tug the gown these days, but uh, <laughs> lady, I'm, I'm reassured by my learned junior that he does not have any further questions or points that he wants me to make, so I shall leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, um, you would be unsurprised to hear that we're going to reserve the judgments in this case. Um, they will be sent to the parties on the usual terms, in the usual way, uh, for typing corrections, but nothing more. And uh, the judgment or judgments will eventually be handed down electronically, as is the practice now of this court. Um, I speak on behalf of the whole court. Our thanks for the detailed skeleton arguments and for the oral submissions today, which have been very helpful. Thank you both very much indeed, and to those who've